Okay, as we're getting back together here, so so we left off with the royal priesthood back here, the peculiar people, peculiar nation. I think we said royal priesthood. Saw it out here in Hebrews. By the way, in almost half of the New Testament, so there's 27 books in your New Testament, 13 of those are written by this guy Paul. You will not see any of those three phrases um, in you know, written by Paul. Royal priesthood doesn't exist. Okay? So Paul never talks about those. Um, okay, so let's come back to Acts chapter 2 where we left off. Your point uh, going from Exodus to 1 Peter was to show the close connection that Peter was saying, hey, this is about to happen. And if it did happen, it would have gone from right there to first of Hebrew and into Peter and John and Revelations. Is that right? Or wrong? Yes. Okay. And for the benefit of the camera, because those are excellent points, just to make sure we understand. So the reason for, for showing that this is this, so the royal priesthood in Hebrews to Revelation, the trib, it was all prophesied in the Old Testament, right from Exodus where we saw royal priesthood. You know, there, that's who God's chosen people are. Okay, that's who they are. They are a royal priesthood. They are a chosen generation. That's who the people out here are. Okay, so, if, and Peter thought this was happening, so if we took this out of here and said, okay, this is next week, and that starts, and here we are, it could have happened by Scripture. Okay, it would, everything would have fit just perfectly. Did that get it back to what you were, yeah. yeah. Yeah, this, this could have just started right there. Peter's Peter and the eleven were thinking that this is where it's going. We're about to go into the wrath. Matter so of fact, that's a great that's a great segue right into the scripture here. Peter and the eleven thought it was we're going into wrath because that's when the Lord can return to set up His kingdom. But they knew this seven years was coming. So thank you for that. Because back to verse thirty three of Acts forty three of Acts chapter two. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles, and all that believed were together and had all things common. Okay, we left off there. Let's, let's watch the Bible define what does it mean to have all things common. Watch the Bible define it. The very next verse, verse 45. And sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. Okay, they're going to become socialists if you will, and have all things together. There is a, a reason somewhere in time to have socialism in place and for all people to have all things common. And here it is in a period of great tribulation. Okay, I'll leave, leave politics out of it. <laughs> I think we're on our way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, Let's jump ahead to, to chapter 4 for a minute, and then we'll come back to verse. <clears throat> okay, chapter 3, verse 32. Uh, chapter 4, verse 32, sorry. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. There's that phrase again, had all things common. Verse 33. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any that lacked among them. Excuse me. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and brought the prices of the things that were sold, and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. So boy, we could sure run with that one right now, couldn't we? All of you go home, put for sale house, uh, signs out in your front yard, sell your houses, and when you sell them for lots and lots of money, bring them back next week and lay it right here at, at our feet and we'll uh, distribute as everybody has need. Of course, I'm probably heading to Mexico in the meantime yeah. once we get there. <laughs> All right? 
and, and that wouldn't be too far off the way some of these television preachers do some of this stuff, especially with healing. Send enough money in and, you know, you're... Anyway, don't even go there. Hey, it was doctrine, though. How are you going to get rid of that if you don't rightly divide the word of truth? It was there. It was scripture. Matter of fact, did he really mean it? Ah, let's keep reading a few verses here. Verse 26. 36. 36, thank you, chapter 4. And Hoseas, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Okay, so he gives us a good example of a guy right there that did it properly. Chapter 5, verse 1. But, whoops, but, contrary to what we just read, the right way to do it, there must be a wrong way. Just like rightly dividing wrongly dividing but verse 1 a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira his wife sold a possession why did it say but they did just what they were supposed to do didn't they uh, verse 2 and kept back part of the price Ooh, his wife also being privy to it and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles feet aha I see what's going on here just in case this Y2K doesn't hit <laughs> okay, we'll sell our land like we're supposed to. We're going to keep back just a little bit, just in case, and we'll bring the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. They won't miss this little bit, will they? I don't know. Let's see. Verse 3. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep part back price of the land? Let's just come at verse 5. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. Wow. Wow. Uh, verse 9, then um, verse 10, so his wife comes, verse 9, then Peter said unto her, so this is his wife, how is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then fell she straight down way at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. Wow, I'd say they were supposed to sell out, sell the possessions, bring all the money, and lay it at the apostles' feet, just like they were commanded. Okay, this was serious doctrine for the church at that time. No, not for doctrine for the church today. But that's why, remember at the beginning, what I was suggesting to you is the people that take Acts 2.38 totally ignore what came before and what came after. This is... You know, what we read earlier in the first hour was all things that happen in the same day. And people take parts and they divide up that day, let alone dividing up the Bible. They divide that day and we get dozens and dozens of religions, right, denominations right there. Is there a question? Uh, yeah. Who, Peter, the Holy Spirit that was in Peter killed these people or they just... I, mean, I would say God Almighty did, Absolutely. Peter's words had enough power to, for them to yield the ghost, to give up the ghost. Now, that had to be God the Father doing that. But a matter of fact, the very next verse there, 11, and great fear came upon all the church as soon as many as heard these things. And that was what Peter was doing, was just acknowledging what was taking yes. place, and then the, yeah. the Lord took it from the there. The Lord took it from there, exactly. Uh, he would be the only one that had the power to do that. You know, in this you see immediate judgment. Immediate judgment. Which is how it will be uh, in the future there. Yes. Up on the board. Okay, you guys are taking me a lot of different places here. And I would say, no, and which is fine. I would, I would suggest to you that Ananias and Sapphira went straight to hell. Do not pass go. Do not collect, you know, $200. Go straight to hell. Why? What did he say in verse 3? Why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Do you remember that passage back there in Matthew chapter 12? Because this is the same doctrine as in Matthew 12. If thou shalt blaspheme the Holy Ghost, it shall be forgiven thee where? Neither, you know, not in this uh, life. This world and the world to come. Neither in this, I got to go back and read it. When, if you can't quote it right, go back and read You don't need to turn there. Matthew 12. Uh, verses 31 and 32, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. I'm going to jump ahead to the middle of 32. 
But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven to him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. The unpardonable sin, Ananias and Sapphira committed it. Oh yeah, in Acts chapter 7, somebody else did. This guy Saul, as he stood there when they were stoning Stephen and they laid their feet at his feet. But Ananias and Sapphira went straight to hell because they blasphemed the Holy Ghost. And it, okay? So thanks for those questions and comments because it, it does all come together. In the, the doctrine here and out here, you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, it's unpardonable sin, straight to hell. You can be forgiven neither in this world nor in the world to come. So Paul is guilty. Nope. No. No. Are they? They're, they're toast. Are they, uh -huh. are they in the bosom or in hell? No, they're in hell. Anybody that goes to hell goes, even today, the year 2013, a person dies today without a testimony of salvation, straight to hell. A person dies with a, a does die with a, did I say that right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, if a person does die with a testimony of salvation today, they go asleep in Christ. Okay, where that is, we don't really know for sure. They're asleep in Christ, though. And let me come ahead because we'll be talking to, about that in a little bit. Okay, so chapter 5. We, we see this going on. Let's back up to chapter 3 now, the beginning of chapter 3. So remember, we're talking about Peter and the 12. We talked about uh, the kingdom of priests, the doctrine, the, the gospel of the kingdom, repent and be baptized. Um, that's the same thing that's going to go on out here during the seven years. The Jews are going to be the ones preaching this to the world out here in Hebrews through Revelation. It all goes together here. We saw tongues. Hey, if they're going to take it to the world, they need to be able to speak in different tongues. Okay? There is a reason for it. We talked about counterfeit $100 bills. How to know the what a counterfeit $100 bill looks like? Learn what a real one is. Tongues. Real languages. Let's look at healings. Another miracle, if you will. So, Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, now watch this phrase, lame from his mother's womb. <coughs> okay? Since birth, he can't walk. Okay? Uh, was carried. Whom they laid, how often? Daily. Daily. And where did they lay him? At the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms of them that enter into the tip, into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. Now, before we go any further, daily, and, and we know later by Scripture, this man is 40. For 40 years, they carry him every day, lay him daily on the steps of the temple. Now, there's a reason he's at the steps, and let's go take a look at that. Let's go back here again. Leviticus, chapter 21. Again, how, so, so where we're headed in our next few minutes is healings. Where's that? Where are we going? Le Leviticus, chapter 21. How do you identify what he, you know, what a, what bad healings, what, what counterfeit healings are? Well, let's identify what true healings are. Okay? And let's look at the why for the healings. Because again, today there are many of these television healers that are just a total abomination to, to God Almighty, a stench in His eyes and His nostrils. Okay, here's why healings existed. Chapter 21 of Le Leviticus, starting in verse 16. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Whoa, how about that? In Exodus chapter 19, when we were looking earlier about the royal priesthood and all that, remember that was the Lord speaking to Moses? Here we are, same thing. Verse 16. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron. Whoa, who's Aaron? He's the chief of the priests, right? Speak unto Aaron, saying, 
whosoever he be of thy seed, that's how you know it's the priests we're talking about, in their generation that hath any blemish, let him not approach to offer the bread of his God. For whatsoever man he be that hath a blemish, he shall not approach. In case you want to know what a blemish is, let's watch the Bible define it. A blind man, or a lame, or he that hath a flat nose, or anything superfluous, or a man that is broken-footed, like the man we're reading about there in Acts 3 right now, or broken-handed, or crooked-backed, or a dwarf, or he that hath a blemish in his eye, or be scurvy, or scab, or hath his stones broken. No man that hath a blemish of the seed of Aaron, the priest, shall come nigh to offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire. He hath a blemish, he shall not come nigh to offer the bread of his God. He shall eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy and of the holy. Only he shall not, now watch these two verses. Only he shall not go in unto the veil, nor come nigh unto the altar, because he hath a blemish, that he profane not my sanctuaries. For I, the Lord, do sanctify them. And Moses told it unto Aaron and to his sons and unto all the children of Israel. Did you see that in verse 23? He would be, a person would be profaning the sanctuary, would be profaning the temple if he only, if he sing, simply went into it. Now, if they're going to be a kingdom of priests, they can't have blemishes, can they? That's why they had healings. So they could be a priest and get out into the world and teach the world, baptizing them in my name, if you will. As was told in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Go ye unto all the world, right? As he commanded them. They're going to go be a kingdom of priests. They could not have a blemish. Therefore, we have healings. Now, back to Acts 3. So, you see what's going on. Peter and John, they're going into the temple. There's this man, 40 years old, sit, being laid at the steps of the temple. He, he asked in alms, Peter, verse 4, Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up and... How quickly? Immediately, immediately your Bible tells you, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him and walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, who's he talking to? Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own hand, by our own power or holiness, we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, and, and on and on he goes now. Okay, so once again, we see these miracles, okay, that are going on. And but we see the reason for the healings, so that they could be a kingdom of priests, so that they could, and, and not only that, but so that they could go into the temple. Nobody that had a blemish was allowed to go into the temple. All right, so it all fits together. All of this is fitting together, isn't it? Okay, there were reasons for all of these. Now we also know. Come over to keep your hand here again, but First Corinthians chapter one. While you're going there, I'm just going to read you a verse we just read, Acts 3.11. Remember, so, and as the lame man 
which was healed, held Peter and John. All the people ran together unto them in the porch of this called Solomon, Solomon's greatly wondering. Okay, all the people see this. They're all coming. Here's one other reason for tongues, for miracles. It's 1 Corinthians, and this is Paul now telling you, looking back on these things, and telling you why people needed this. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. For the Jews require a sign. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. See, the Jews needed these signs. And of course, putting scripture with scripture, we know that tongues are for a sign. Okay? So all again, it all fits together. I mean, it just it couldn't be more clear when you take the whole Bible and put the all the Bible together. All uh, scripture is profitable for doctrine. And all means what? All. Always has, always will. Okay, so this is what Peter's getting on with. And we see that he thinks this is coming. He's preparing them. He's preparing them financially. He's preparing them uh, uh, physically, if you will. The healing's going on so they can all be a kingdom of priests. They're showing the miracles so that they show that they've got the power because the Jews need that sign. We saw the tongues, again, a sign, but also so they can go unto all the nations. They think this is coming. All right, so that's where we are in time frame at that time. There was reason for everything Peter was doing. And we see that in <coughs> Acts 4. We see it in Acts, or we saw it in Acts 3. We see it in Acts 4. Acts 5 was Ananias and Sapphira. Oh, by the way, one other thing about healings while we're in Acts chapter 5. Or let's go back to Acts chapter 5. So we just read about Ananias and Sapphira. We left off in Acts 5.11, and great fear come upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these things. Verse 12. <coughs> By the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. By the way, in the King James Bible, the people is always the <coughs> Jews. That is the early Jewish church. The people. Uh, and they, okay, verse 12, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch, and of the rest, verse, no man joined himself to them, but the people magnified them. The people magnified the twelve. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. Okay, end of parentheses. Insomuch that they brought, now watch healings again. Watch these next two verses. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick unto the streets, and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed. Anybody going to say, well, wait a minute, you didn't finish the verse? And the end of verse 16 says, And they were healed every one. Wow, that's a little different than the TV healers, isn't it? They were healed every one. Wow. Again, a little different than what we see practiced today by people that want to think and just jump all over healings. And, and we've all been at some point in our lives just wishing that that were true today, that there were men that had the gift of healing that could come and, and heal someone by putting their hand on. By the way, here it was, Peter just passing by, his shadow would overshadow them, and they were healed. Wow, if somebody would have that power today. Of course, who would get the glory? But the point is, again, why were the healings? It wasn't just to show their power that the twelve had, it was because he's preparing them to be a kingdom of priests. And they couldn't have a blemish. There were reasons for all of it. Again, at the very beginning, my statement to you is, if you're going to take Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the mission of sins, and you're going to be in that doctrine, which is the apostles' doctrine, you got to be in all of the apostles' doctrine. Peter sure was. Everything we've been reading here was all the same doctrine, right? But the healings, 
That's so key at the end of verse 16. And they were healed every one. That, that just, I mean, if that doesn't say it, it's right there. Every single person. And it took just the shadow of, of Peter to heal them. Okay, so. So, Steve, if, if Acts 2.38 and the healings and the tongues, I mean, either, either it's got to be all of that is for today. Okay? It can't just be repent and be baptized. All right, now I'm going to get myself in hot water, but sorry, Baptists and Church of Christ. It can't be just repent and be baptized and then leave out the tongues and leave out the healings. If that's for, am I, again, if that is doctrine for today, how, by what scripture do you divide out the tongues? By what scripture do you divide out the gift of the Holy Spirit? coming upon you, or the gift of the Holy Ghost, as they call it. By, by what scripture do you take away healings? By what scripture do you take away having all things common, selling out, bringing the money, disseminating it upon your <coughs> congregation as the people have need? It all went together here. Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. How do you do that? Well, the only way you can do it is if something major changed. It did. Come to, come to Acts chapter 9. Actually, come to Acts 8 because we'll use the end of 7 and the beginning of 8. Acts chapter 7, of course, is the, the stoning of Stephen. And if ever you want to have a good one-chapter summary... Of Genesis through John, almost. Read Acts chapter 7. Stephen just gives a great accounting of all the, everything you needed to know and, you know, the cliff notes, if you will, of the Bible. Acts chapter 7, that's it. Up until that point in time. Okay. Acts chapter 7, at the end, uh, verse 58. So they cast him out of the city, that's Stephen. And they stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Uh, you know, dead. Okay? So, a couple of things there. Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. <coughs> A lot of people kind of skip right over that. Blasphemy right there. Go back to verse 51. This is what he's referring to when he says, so this is Stephen talking, verse 51, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. You do blaspheme. So I'm talking now, not the scripture. They're blaspheming the Holy Ghost, gang. Everybody that's there, they're blaspheming the Holy Ghost. What did Matthew 12, 31 tell us earlier? You shall be forgiven when? Never. Neither in, yeah, never. Neither in this world, nor in the world to come. The unpardonable sin back there. Oh, and whose feet in verse 60? Uh, or, or verse um, uh, 58, the end there. They laid their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. Eight, uh, chapter 8, verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death. And at that time, there was a great persecution uh, uh, against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad and on and on. Okay, Verse 3. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Matter of fact, if you read Acts 22 and Acts 26... When Paul gives his accounting back here to this time frame, matter of fact, and, and what we're going to read in just a minute in Acts 9, Paul actually had these people not just committed this to prison, he had them killed, many of them killed. And by the way, he even says, men, women, children. Yeah, Paul, Saul, excuse me, at this time, Saul is the one responsible for the death of we don't know how many, but I would say hundreds of believers of this church. And he was blaspheming the Holy Ghost 
as we just read. Could Paul ever be saved in this world or the world to come by Matthew 12, 31? No, you cannot miss it. No. <coughs> well, something had to change or Paul is, uh, Paul's in hell. Something had to change. Let's go to Acts chapter 9 now, the beginning. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of... So who did he go to? The high priest, okay, of the Jewish religion. Verse 2, and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way... And here's one other thing, by the way, gang. In your King James Bible, this way, and you'll see a phrase, that way. This way is always... The early church that Peter and the Twelve were setting up, that way will, will be referring to the doctrine that the church, which is the body of Christ, that Paul starts presenting after Acts chapter 10. <coughs> okay, very, it's 100% consistent in a King James Bible. Okay, so verse 2, if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Actually, keep your hand here. Let's take, this is important enough to see. Come to uh, Acts chapter 22. This is Paul giving his, well, so 22 verse 1. Men, brethren, and fathers, hear ye my defense which I make now unto you. Okay, so he starts talking. Come down to verse 4. And I persecuted this way. There you go again. There's that phrase, this way. And I persecuted this way unto the death, binding and delivering into prisons both men and women. Come over to Acts chapter 26 now. One more accounting of this. Paul giving his own accounting of it. Acts chapter 26, watch verse 10. Verse 9. I verily thought with myself that I, I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth, which thing I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. And I punished them off in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And both exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Whereupon, as I went to Damascus, okay, so now we're going to go back to Acts 9. So do you see, Paul was, he was murdering these people, gang. I mean, he did it by the law, so I guess that's not murder, but, you know, he had the authority to do it. But that's his own accountings of... of what we just read here in Acts, the end of Acts 7, Acts 8, beginning of Acts 9. So Paul, verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, <coughs> and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? He knew exactly who it was, didn't he? Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Never questioned it a bit, did he? Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He knew good and well who was talking to him at this point. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. I wonder why at this point he was okay to succumb as opposed to earlier like in seven or before that he was like a bad dude well so so the question is why did he succumb so quickly here where in the past earlier scriptures he was a bad dude he was a bad dude but he thought he was doing what god would have him to do paul was a jew of the jews a hebrew of the hebrews he studied at the feet of a man named Gamaliel, which would be for you know a man of law back there. That would be like saying he went to Harvard Business uh, Law School here. I mean, he went to the elite 
law school in the entire country. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel. The reason that he was going to Damascus, he thought this way, as the Bible called it, the church at the Twelve were sitting. He knew that was contrary to the Jewish church, and he was doing, you know, the law. So that's why he was throwing this way, Peter and the Twelve and any of those believers, locking them up. He thought it was contrary to Jewish law the Jewish church, if you will. He didn't realize there had been a first change, and now we're about to see a second change. Him being a Pharisee also was part of that hog Harvard Law School. You got college. it. Absolutely. So it all fit together like that. Okay. And also on that, you know, uh, the light from heaven blinded him. Yes. I'm sure the flesh jumped into the picture real yeah. quick. Yeah. And then, you know, also he knew that it was the Lord, but you know, he's blind sitting on the street hearing a voice from heaven. Yeah. I think I'm listening yeah, to it. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of like one of those, you know when you know that you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, all the things that were just said, I don't need to repeat. Um, he just, he's going along his way thinking he's doing God's work. And like I said, he got blinded, and he's hearing the voice. And, and I'm sure the authority of that voice... I mean, much like the way the Ten Commandments movie, you know, with Charlton Heston and, and you know, the way the Lord, God's <coughs> voice is portrayed. I mean, you know, I would, I would assume that, and that is an assumption, so I will make sure I'm saying this is an assumption, that that voice was extremely authoritative. There was no question to whom he was speaking. All right? In, in light of all the other things there, too. Okay, so, this is where Paul gets saved. And things change in your Bible. From Acts chapter 9 on, things change and they don't just change a little. Because all the way from Genesis 1-1, clear on up here we are, and I'll just make this, I'll make this now, Acts 9. All the way up until here, it has been Jew, 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 Jew. God and the Jews Peculiar people, royal priest, or um, what priesthood? Royal. royal priesthood. All right, chosen people. They're God's chosen people. All the way up here until Acts 9, it is always, always, always the Jews. Okay? Now, could there be some Gentiles? Yes. Because back here in Genesis chapter 12, God the Father made a promise to this guy Abraham. And basically he said, I'll bless them to bless thee and curse them to curse thee. So any Gentile could align themselves with Israel. Okay? He that feareth God and worketh righteousness, okay, align with Israel, give alms to the people like that guy Cornelius in Acts 10. They could align. They did have a way to align. Very few did. But Gentiles were dogs all the way up to Acts 9. All right? So, some things change. And this is, what, so Acts 9, you know, Paul tells us in Timothy that he was the first to get into the body of Christ. The church which is his body. A new church started. Now, I'm going to say it started in Acts 9 when Paul got saved, okay? I don't want to get wrapped up in when it started, when it didn't. I do know this. The Bible tells us Paul is the first one in it. That's when he got saved, is Acts chapter 9. That's when. The, so the church, which is the body of Christ, I would say, therefore, had to start in Acts chapter 9. Okay, if you want to disagree, go ahead and disagree. That's, that's another... Anyway, so Acts 9, we know that Paul is the first. Something changes. This church, which is the body of Christ, is called a mystery. That's the word mystery for the... I'll tell you what, I'll get on the other side because we want to get mystery up here. So this is a period of mystery, is what your Bible calls it. It also calls it the dispensation of the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 3. The dispensation of the grace of God. The dispensation of the grace of God started Acts 28, the end of Acts 28, okay? But the body of Christ started with when Paul was saved, 
All of this period is called a mystery in your Bible, where all of this back here was all prophecy. And remember, we even read some of it. We saw Peter jumping right into the prophecy. So back here is prophecy. Out here in the future, seven-year period, is that prophesied? Mm -hmm. Thousand-year kingdom, is that prophesied yep. uh, to the T? You know, the crucifixion, was that prophesied? Thousand uh, prophecies about that. So we have prophecy in the future again. We saw Exodus 19 and Leviticus 21 agree perfectly with the doctrine that's going to be out here. And First Tim, uh, First Peter, you know, the kingdom of priests. All right? This is a mystery. And Paul tells us it's hid in scriptures. Why do we do all this again? It's to get the right gospel for salvation. Okay, that's the key. Because Paul preaches a different gospel. All right? So the first book that he wrote that becomes scripture in your Bible is the book of Romans. Well, let's go to Romans chapter 1. Right in the very first book that shows up in scriptures, in your Bible, written by this guy, I'm going to say Paul, so in Acts 13 his name is changed from Saul to Paul. Romans chapter 1 and verse 15. Paul says, So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel the gospel to you there at Rome also. Well, which gospel is it? you got to ask yourself, which gospel? Very critical. Next verse, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Whoa, okay. <coughs> Can't miss that. It's the gospel of Christ that we're talking about. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. For time's sake, i got to jump ahead. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Bad clock management today. <laughs> Moreover, uh, verse 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. We're talking about the gospel of Christ. By the way, Paul wrote 1 Corinthians um, just a little bit before he wrote the book of Romans. But, I mean, very much within the same year we know that. Okay, so same time frame. Chapter 15, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, like he just did in Romans chapter 1, uh, where he mentioned the gospel of Christ. Uh, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. And he does not say ye will be saved. He says ye are saved. Because we get it immediately. None of these people ever had immediate salvation. Okay? Repent and be baptized that your sins may, Peter told them, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come, and it's at the second coming. If we were to go back and read Acts 3.19. Okay, and here is the gospel of Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Yeah. Oh, I left three very key words out of there. But what I just read to you, how many people today in those 300 and some denominations will be saying, it's the death, burial, and resurrection. You just got to believe that. Um, does Satan believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ? He sure does. If there's anybody that understands what happened was the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, it's Satan. Because he thought he won when, he when, when the Lord was crucified on that cross. He thought he won. And he knows good and well that he was raised from the dead. And it was, oh, no. And not only that, flip back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Look what else Satan and the rest of us know about that, this event right there. The resurrection of Christ. Verse number 7 of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Paul says, But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Well, there's that word again, mystery. In a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom, 
which God ordained before the world unto our glory. So even back here before the world started, he ordained it to our glory. And in the context, our is saved people, Gentiles. To our glory, verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew. Why? For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Wow, that's it right there. That's why it was a mystery hidden scriptures. Because had they known that he was going to raise, rise again for our justification, they wouldn't have crucified him in the first place. Satan thought he won when he killed him. And he had the, you know, the men kill him. Verse 8, which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's why today, oh, in those three verses I left, or three words I left out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 and 4, that he died for our sins. Back here, not just the death, burial, and resurrection, he died for our sins. That's what the mystery part of it was, is that he would die for our sins. Another book that was written, I mean, probably within a month of Romans is 2 Corinthians, if you'll go there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You've got to put these together. Right at the end of, of uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 19. So this is talking about the crucifixion. To wit, that God was in Christ. Right here, he was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. Did you see that? Not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Verse 21, For he, God, hath made him, Christ, to be sin for us. Who knew no sin? Christ lived a sinless life, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Wow, amen to that. You are the righteousness of God in him. Are you righteous? Yes, you are. You have a testimony of salvation. You have the righteousness of God in him. Amen. It does not get better than that. If, uh, go to Ephesians chapter 1. You've got to grab hold of this salvation that Paul taught us. You see, all back here, and I've run out of time to use more verses. But back here from Genesis all the way until Acts 9, it was faith that saved people, but with the deeds of the law. And starting out here in the seven-year trib, and for the sake of time, that starts when this period ends with the rapture of the church, the calling out of the body of Christ, then the seven years, then the kingdom, and out here, it is faith with the deeds of the law. Just as it was here, so shall it be there. Kingdom of priests, kingdom of priests. A royal priesthood, royal priesthood. Chosen generation, chosen generation. Faith with deeds. Faith with the deeds of the law. Grace, yeah. They, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord, but he had to work. He had to do the deeds he was told. Same out here. In this mystery period, it is, it is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are ye saved, not for by grace will ye be saved. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Romans chapter 3 would also tell you there's no deeds involved. Galatians 2.16, seeing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Okay, you can't miss it. It will be out here. James chapter 2 verse 24, absolutely he's justified by his works. Okay, that's the way it all works. Last verse. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. You can put your name in here, right here. So the end of verse 12, who first trusted in Christ, so in whom is Christ? In whom ye also trusted. Put your name in there, because this is the gospel of your salvation. 
just like it was in 1 Corinthians 15, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Okay, the gospel, first, uh, the gospel of Christ is the word of truth. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. And Ephesians 4.30 tells us we are sealed unto the day of redemption. So don't ever forget that. There's nothing you can do, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. There's nothing you can do to gain your salvation. And praise the Lord, there's nothing you can do to lose your salvation. Nobody goes to hell for committing sin. The only people that go to hell are those that reject the love of the truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. God shall send them strong delusion that they will believe a lie so that they might be damned because they receive not the love of the truth. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That's what sends people to hell. All right? So it all fits together. If you're going to take 2.38, Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the mission of sins, you got to take what comes before. you got to take what comes after. And if you live prior to Acts 9, it all fit together. And if you live after the church leaves this earth, the church which is the body of Christ, it all fits together. It does not fit anywhere in here. It is simply Ephesians 1.13, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Okay? This is consistent here. That was consistent there. And we'll continue out there. That's why this is called a mystery. Paul is your apostle. He tells us that 13 times in Romans through Philemon. Appreciate each of you being here this morning.